Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Supporting Students in Distress GSIs and the Gold Folder webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Thursday, September 19th, 2013. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Aaron Cohen and Dr. Susan Bell. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Susan Bell, and I'm a psychologist at Counseling and Psychological Services here on campus. I'm the Assistant Director and Manager of Outreach and Consultation. And I will be co-presenting with Aaron Cohen, who will introduce himself in just a moment. Uh, we're really glad that you could join us today. One of the most common reasons that GSIs call Counseling and Psych Service is concern about undergraduates that they teach. Yet we know that it can be a daunting task to pick up the phone and call us. With over 1,800 GSIs on campus and many new in the role, we wanted to make sure that it was clear who to call and what to do if you were concerned about someone. Let me now introduce you to Dr. Aaron Cohen. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Cohn. I'm a psychologist with Counseling and Psych Services. Uh, I actually am our liaison to the residential community, uh, and, and at least for another year, I'm our CalMesa grant coordinator. Um, the, 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 actually, the CalMesa grant is what is allowing us to do this webinar, so I do have to kind of give it props. Uh, and say that, that uh, all 10 campuses are, are working under the Office of the President on this CalMesa grant. It stands for Cal California Mental Health Services Authority. Uh, and it's a grant that has been given to all 10 campuses in order to allow us to, to promote um, you know, suicide prevention uh, practices on our campus uh, and promote you know, positive mental health uh, and access to mental health on our campuses. So uh, I'll talk more about the Gold Folder as we move into this, but the Gold Folder was a, a creation of this grant, um, and this webinar is a, is, a, is a creation of the grant. So I did kind of want to acknowledge that. So I've done, I've been the recipient, I've been on the, rec the receiving end of a webinar, and then I've done a, a handful of webinars. And the one thing as Susan and I start presenting, I kind of want to acknowledge out loud, is just the weirdness of, you know, Susan and I are sitting in a room here, and, you know, we've, we do presentations around campus, and we feel really comfortable when we stand in front of classrooms and groups that we can kind of read groups, we can you know, see when someone raises an eyebrow to kind of then just kind of automatically switch into clarification mode or, uh, you know, and, and, or if, you know, people are nodding, we kind of get, you know, those nonverbals that help us kind of move through the presentation. And we don't have that. We can't see you. And while, of course, we like to think that you all are rolling on the ground in laughter when we make a joke and we will fantasize that way, you know, we just don't have the opportunity to see you. The flip side is that you don't get to see us, and, and you don't get to see how um, excited we are to present and how our body language really shows that we, we care about the students on our campus, both undergraduate and graduate, and we really see this as a wonderful way to, you know, promote how do we help students on our campus get support. So, you know, we're, we're both at a disadvantage that we can't see each other on that, and I hope that that, that we can kind of get through that. And, and we, will, we will fantasize and picture you all nodding your heads in, in agreement, and I, I hope that you will see us being very active and excited about this, about the, um, the presentation. I also want to let you know that we have a surprise guest today. Um, Alfred Day, the care manager from the Dean of Students Office, has joined us. And, and as we move towards the end and start talking a little bit about the Students of Concern Committee, he's going to chime in. Um, and just so you know, we are passing a headset around, so it takes a little bit of a, of a, a slight movement when we, when we change speakers. Um, so one of the things I want you to do as we start this webinar um, is the, the second slide is, you know, you can, you can read these, but let me kind of say out loud, I want you all to take a moment, and you don't, if there are multiple folks in the room, you can, you can kind of discuss it for a second, but I want you to take a moment to think a little bit about, you know, 
from your own views, you know, what are your thoughts on, on, on help-seeking behavior? You know, what are your thoughts about depression? When you hear the word suicide, when you hear the word counseling, mental health, what are some of the, the messages that you all received when you were growing up, whether it be, you know, from your family, uh, from your cultural perspective, from your religious perspective? I think it's really important as we move through this presentation and as you reflect on the presentation and start doing the work that you're doing on campus that you, you realize that we all come to the table you know, with our own perspectives. When I do counseling, I come to the table with my history. And I have to be aware of that as I'm reflecting with, with students. You know, so for example, was getting help valued when you were growing up? Were you told, you know, it's important to get help and ask for help when you need it? You know, things like that I think are really important to think about. And again, we're never going to know everything about the person, the student sitting in front of you, but kind of being aware that we all kind of come to the table with different perspectives can, can, can give us a, the, the flexibility um, in the moment. So some other thoughts that we want you to have as we go through this is just, you know, you know, what would you, what's your initial thought? What would you do if, you know, if an undergraduate, were you, an undergraduate you were teaching was struggling emotionally? How would you even know that? How far would you go to help a student? And I think one of the things that Susan and I are going to continually be talking about through this presentation is, is boundaries, you know, and thinking about where does your role as a GSI end, and, you know, when is it appropriate for you really to, to be referring a student and not to be talking to a student? On the flip side, we want you to be comfortable being able to talk to students and not feeling like you have the minute a student says, I'm struggling, oh, you've got to call the counseling center. There's a lot that you all can be doing. So kind of thinking through some of that. Um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, uh, what would, what would, when would you know when it was a time to refer? Um, how would you do that? And then m equally as important is what, what are you going to do for yourself when you're starting to deal with this? Um, you know, I know that as we start to talk about these protocols, even in our own unit, today we talked about some emergency protocols. And, you know, it can be daunting. You know, you can say on paper, this is the protocol we want you to follow, but, it, you know, on paper it's dynamic, you know, it's th these, are s these are dynamic situations and they change quickly. So, you know, want you to kind of ground, take a deep breath for this presentation. Um, know that our hope is that your, a lot of your anxieties, a lot of your thoughts about this will be alleviated, but we also recognize that at the end of this you go, whoa, there's, there can be a lot going on on our campus. So, and we like to kind of acknowledge that. Um, okay, so I think I'm taking a moment to stop for a poll that we need to do. I think now that many people have signed in, we do know that, that there are some folks that are in rooms with multiple people. So one thing that would be really helpful for us right now is for you to go online. I think there, it just, there's a poll up now that says how many are in the room with you. If you could just fill that out. And if it's just you, just put one. And I'll step back for 30 seconds while you do that. Okay, I think hopefully that did it. So we're going to move on to the to the start of to the start of this. I know that we we have about an hour and a half. We're supposed to go till noon. Um, what you know what we're what we're trying to do today is is really you know help you all understand the reasons why students start to have some distress. Now I'm assuming that many of you have come just come from your undergraduate years, and so that I think it can be intuitive for you why students are struggling. But, you know, we want to talk a little bit about some of the things we see at Cal. Um, we want to talk a little bit about how you may experience distress in the classroom or in your office hours. And then again, the role you play and the appropriate boundaries so you can feel comfortable with what the work that you do. Um, you know, and, and start to get you thinking about what you're going to do when you start worrying about a student. And then again, we're going to always cycle back, even in our office, we're constantly cycling, cycling back to how do we take care of ourselves. And we're going to be talking about that. Let me say something about 
questions and answers throughout this. Again, if, Su if Susan and I were standing in front of you, we'd probably be doing this in a much more conversation way. Um, you know, obviously this way it's a little harder. If you have a question, go ahead and type it into that chat area. And what we'll try to do is monitor those as we go through the presentation. If we feel like it's a good time to answer it, we will chime in and answer it. If we feel like we're going to answer it later within another context, we'll do that. Um, we may or may not be able to get to all the questions, but we will try as hard as we can to do that. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And I am now going to pass this along to Susan. Okay, we are first going to talk about your role as a GSI. There have been a number of surveys on our campus, and they are consistent in finding that over half of our undergraduate students at UC Berkeley uh, every, have an emotional issue that interferes with their academic success at least once in the past year. What we know also is that most students will not talk to a counselor first. What they will do is talk to, um, can you hear me? Okay. What they will do is they will talk to people that they know. They will talk to their family, to their friends, to the GSIs. Often they will, are closer to you than to the faculty that, they're, that are in, in the classroom. So that's why it's so important to know when to be concerned and to know what to do. What do we mean by gatekeeper training? It's it's one of the more popular interventions used in suicide prevention, and it's considered a campus best, best practice. And what it is is educating natural helpers to recognize warning signs for suicide and con connect them to help. So in this case, as a GSI, you would be the natural link. You would be the one to open the gate between a student and a mental health professional. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. In my experience in working with GSIs, GSIs really want to help undergraduates that they teach. And sometimes they want to help them more than they actually can. It's easy to get over-involved, trying to support students, and it's hard sometimes to know where the boundaries are. Um, because you can remember so clearly what it was like to be an undergraduate, it's easy to get very involved because you might identify with the students that you're teaching. You might understand the feelings that they're talking about and say, wow, I felt that too. And so you can get more involved as a result of that. But it's important to understand that you're in a com complicated role because you're not just there to support them, but you're also in a position of evaluating them. So you really can't be, be their counselor. Not only that, you're also not trained as a counselor. You're an instructor. So that's why it's so important to be a gatekeeper, to get them to the right place, to get them to somebody who's trained to help them out. I'm going to talk a little bit now about stress in undergraduates. And some of this is intuitive. And if you think back on when you were an undergraduate, you may remember some of these stressors. Um, so the first one has to do with developmental challenges. Most of the students, but not all, are early adulthood, and they are trying to figure out who they are. It may be their first time away from their family. They don't yet have a community here if they're in their first year. They may not have developed skills for caring for themselves, such as ma managing their finances, managing their time, eating, sleeping, alcohol and drugs. They may be making decisions for the first time on their own without parental rules. There, there's also a lot that's going on in, for undergraduates with relationships. Sometimes people are in their first romantic relationship, learning how to have a healthy one. They may be figuring out sexual orientation. They may be coming out. Um, this is, relationships create a lot of stress for undergraduates here on our campus and elsewhere. Figuring out who they are, how they fit in, Choosing a career, choosing a major, those are some of the big issues that are a source of stress for, for undergraduates. There's also some very built-in pressures here at Berkeley that are real. It's a large campus. It can be anonymous. Resources are out there, but students need to seek them out. They don't seek the students out. There can be bureaucracy that's difficult to deal with. And the work changes. The pace can be fast. and 
it, um, the tests are different than students may be used to. And many students are used to being the creme de la creme in their high schools or community college, and now they're coming here to Berkeley, and they may be getting C's. And that is a, um, it actually can really hit their, them hard, and it's a blow to their self-esteem. Many undergraduates do not know what to expect from professors, and they do not know what to expect from you as their GSIs. They haven't had GSIs before. Our first generation college students, our minority students, face ad additional sets of challenges. They may have few, few models of how to deal with college. They can't turn to family if nobody in their family has been to college before. It can be very overwhelming, wondering where they belong, wondering if they're an imposter and, and they really don't belong here at all. And there could be pressure to be a role model for their community at home. I'll also say a few things about cultural conflicts. Uh, many of our students do struggle in how much they um, will change who they are to fit into Berkeley and how much to hold on to their cultural and family values. For example, students may feel pressure from their family to choose a certain major, to go into medicine, or to choose an um, engineering degree when they may be interested in the social sciences or the humanities, and they can feel very trapped and not know where to, what to do. Our international students may have other kinds of difficulties with culture shock when they come here, and language and cultural differences may make them feel isolated and can pro provide opportunities for misunderstandings in relationships and also in the classroom. Life events, uh, just um, thinking about it, students are here four or five years. Many things happen during that time. Uh, there's divorces in families, there's illness, there's death, there's financial hardship, all illnesses that, that for, for the students themselves. These kinds of things really do have an impact and cause a lot of stress. There's also a balancing of multiple roles. Many of our students here at Berkeley are balancing jobs and school. Uh, they may be balancing things at home with school, and they may, they're, all of them are managing, managing school and balancing that with their social life. So these are some of the sources of stress for our undergraduates. And there are indeed more, but we just wanted to highlight a few. So while stress is very real for our student, there are also some serious mental health issues that many of our students face. Uh, this is actually, an, uh, there's a national trend for more serious mental health issues on college campuses. So, and it's not just our perception, it actually has been looked at nationwide. In some of these studies, they've um, found that there are more students using counseling centers. I believe 85% of the counseling centers nationwide are reporting these kinds of increases. There are more students with serious mental health issues, such as depression, bipolar disorder, more students who are psychotic. There are actually more students on psychiatric medications than ever before. In 1998, there were approximately 9% of students on psychiatric medications. And then in 2010, the number went went up to 24%. It's probably much higher now. Nationwide surveys suggest that 7 to 10% of college students seriously consider suicide. And the, these kinds of trends are not just national, but they're also here on our campus. We have had a 50% increase in utilization of counseling since 2001. If you look at all the C UCs across the board, there's a 70% increase. And we have many psychiatric hospitalizations a year. When I first started here approximately 20 years ago, there were maybe three or four psychiatric hospitalizations a year. And now we have over 100 a year. That gives you a sense of how things have changed. Many people ask, why is this the case? What, what is changing? It, it's, there are a lot of hypotheses out there. It's not clear. It could be that there's more stress or stress at an earlier age. It could be that there's earlier treatment and better treatments for um, depression and some of the mental health disorders so that people can get on some of the newer antidepressants young, at a younger age and, students, and folks that would not have made it to college may be making it here in larger numbers. And when they get here, compliance with the medication may go down or there may be other stressors that contribute to problems. 
but we really don't know exactly why this is happening. I do want to say a few things about the relationship between student mental health and violence. Since Virginia Tech in 2007, there's been a great deal of worry on college campuses about mass shootings and violence. And the recent shootings in New Newtown and in um, Oikos and in um, northern Illinois have increased that worry. Um, we get a lot of calls from faculty, staff, and GSIs worried that a student might be potentially violent. Um, and, and we do want to get those calls, and we want to address those issues and, um, and sort out whether there, whether there is a um, need for alarm. But I do want to say that um, while camp, campus violent is, violence is still relatively rare, and um, while it is true that some mental health is, issues, such as alcohol and drug use and paranoia, might raise the risk of violence, actually there are far more uh, folks who have mental illness who are victims of crime. And actually the form of violence, um, if they are to initiate, would more likely be suicide or self-harm rather than harm to others. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death among college students. So how might you experience a distressed student? There are many ways that you may see this. You may see a student who's distressed in your office hours. A student may come in very tearful, come in um, crying, confiding about personal issues at home, uh, confiding about financial issues, a whole range of concerns. They may, there may be repeated requests for accommodations. They might continue to come asking for extensions because of things that are going on for them. Emails, I, this is, it's a new world now, and, and a lot of students are communicating with their GSIs through emails. And you may get emails that don't make sense, that are confusing, that are, are threatening in some way. And then there's also classroom behavior. You may have students who are disruptive in class, argumentative. There may be things you notice about um, their presentation. They may seem very spaced out or dazed or confused or confusing when they talk. So you may actually see behaviors in the classroom that have you concerned. You really do want to trust your instinct, instincts. When something doesn't seem right, you want to pay attention to this. And Aaron will be going through in more detail what some of the signs of distress are, what kinds of signs to look out for. But I just wanted to give you an overview of the different arenas in which you might see it. Okay. Hello, it's Aaron again. And um, I know we had gotten some, some feedback on the different sound levels between Susan and I, so I'm not sure if that means I need to talk a little lower. I know that we're going we're gonna, to, this, uh, the, the headset is mine, so it may be that my voice is, I'm, it's, I know exactly where I need to put it. Um, so as she talks, we'll make sure that we, we keep moving it as needed. Um, so let me, I do want to take a moment to talk a little bit about what the gold folder is. I, we're not going to, uh, this presentation is not going to be a reading of the gold folder, though we are going to, as we talk about some of the indicators, we're going to go through them just like they're listed on the gold folder. Um, the hope is that you all have the opportunity to ha have a copy of the gold folder and that you've read through it or that you will read through it. So we don't want to read, read it you know, verbatim. Um, but overall, the, the gold folder is a system-wide attempt to to kind of clarify and streamline and, and have some system-wide communication on how we support students in distress. So like I said, all 10 campuses have a, have a I'm going to say this now, it's a little confusing, they have a red folder. So nine campuses have a red folder and we have a gold folder. Um, literally when we came out with this and everyone started talking red folder, there was some concern that red is an emergency color and we don't want it to look like that. But more feedback came through that we could not have a folder that, that is the same color as Stanford. So that is why we have a gold folder and not a red folder. Um, you know, and like I said, all 10 campuses have it. If it, it's, a, you know, it's a reference guide for faculty, staff, and GSI. Um, you know, it talks about possible indicators, uh, how to approach a student, you know, different campus protocols and resources, and we will try to, um, you know, to, uh, to, 
to talk about all these things. Uh, there is a question on how, how to um, access the Gold folder if you don't have it yet. Um, we will post by the end, because I'm still learning how to do some of this webinar stuff. We, there's actually, you can, uh, the Gold folder is online, and we will give you the link to the Gold folder by the end of the, uh, the presentation. So when, when Sue ta Susan talks next, I will figure out how to print up a link for you. Um, and, and if you have not received the Gold folder, uh, the, the GSI Resource Center has, I think, about 2,000 of them. So uh, you can go there and pick it up as well. Um, just, I do want to let you know some other things that we've done with the grant besides the gold folder. Um, you know, we have a, a phone app that is being introduced in the next couple week, uh, a couple weeks. Um, one will be for students uh, in terms of how to um, access support if, if you're in distress or um, you feel like a friend is in distress. So that's, you'll start seeing things on campus for that over the next couple weeks. We are also actually going to be turning the gold folder into a smartphone app. I'm hoping that will come out in mid-October. Uh, we are also working on a book that is a, a, is a thicker version and a more detailed version um, of the gold folder, and each department will be receiving that reference guide um, at some point, um, probably not until the spring, the way it's looking now. Um, you know, so we're really trying to look at a broad array of supports for students and for faculty and staff and GSIs. Um, so some basic things about what you can do um, as we kind of start through this. Um, you know, so one of the things we, we want you to do is we want you to be able to identify the signs. We want you to be able to, you don't have to be a detective. You don't have to be able to read people's minds. What we want you to be able to do is recognize when a student hits you over the head with something that's going on for them. Not that, again, that you're going to be their counselor, but that you can recognize it and say, you know, there, there's some folks that may be able to support you on this campus. You should be able, as a GSI, to express concern. You know, knowing, kind of recognizing when someone might be in distress, saying, hey, let's talk privately as opposed to at the front of the classroom with 200 students there. You know, and, and focus, we always tell kind of one of the themes that we do is we try to have people focus on behavior um, and be very direct. So, you know, I do a lot of work with residents' life staff, and I will say to them, you know, don't say to someone, oh, I think you might be depressed. Say to someone, you know, I, I saw you crying. Is there something that I can do to support you? Um, so kind of focusing on the behavior. You don't have to make um, diagnoses. Um, you know, and knowing how to suggest and encourage the use of campus resources. And I think this is a good time for me to plug in that when we say campus resources, we don't, um, it doesn't always mean the Dean of Students Office and the Counseling Center. Um, all GSIs should get to know the undergraduate advisors in their, in their department because the undergraduate advisors are they're golden. I mean, they really know the resources on campus. And it may be that some things can, can um, you know, that the, the undergraduate advisors, you know, your, the professor um, can oftentimes be a good resource. It may be that you're looking at things like the Chavez Center uh, for Student Support Services and tutoring. Um, there, many of the departments that you work in have peer mentors. So now would be a good time after this after this uh, talk to say to find out from the undergraduate advisor, are there is there a peer mentor program? Just so you have that in your pocket, um, in in terms of resources available to you, we very much and this is a big thing we're trying to do with this grant. We are trying to normalize help seeking behavior, and whether that's help seeking behavior to to ask your GSI, whether that's help seeking behavior to talk to your advisor, whether that's help seeking behavior to to talk to a, a religious person, or whether that's help seeking behavior to go to the dean of students or come to the counseling center. We want to normalize these things. Um, you know, we, want you, we do want you to know how to direct folks to the counseling center. Um, we want you to be able to know about the, the Students of Concern Committee. And again, if there's one thing you take out of this, consult, consult, consult. You never have to feel like you're alone um, in any of these kinds of issues. Okay, next slide. So what, what is on the gold folder? And I am going to be very specific about this, at least to start, to, give you, to start to give you language in terms of um, the kinds of things we're going to want you to look for. And again, this is a language that's going to start to get standardized. You know, the hope is that professors are look, kind of looking for some of these indicators. Now, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, but also your colleagues on all campuses are kind of 
looking at, okay, what are the academic indicators? What are the physical, the psychological, and some of the safety risk? You know, so again, just trying to give you a sense of that. And the way I kind of look at these indicators is a little bit along the lines of kind of nature, duration, and intensity. So, you know, any, I mean, when we get to the safety indicators, that's something where immediately you may want to get some support. But any of these other indicators, you know, you want to think just in general, is this out of context? Is this in context? You know, how long maybe am I, am I witnessing this? Again, you're not a detective, but, oh, I've been witnessing this for a month. That's different from witnessing it for a day. You know, and what about, you know, is it, it, does it feel like this is a normal response? Again, I go back to you all having been undergraduates at some point. I think you can, you know, within, your, within that continuum, get a range for what feels like a reasonable response versus what feels like it's, not all that reasonable. Um, you know, a lot of times we use the, I guess this is a legal term, I hate quoting legal terms, but the reasonable person standard. You know, if, if 10 people were to see a behavior, would, you know, eight or nine of them kind of look at it in a very similar way? There are always going to be some outliers. So let's start off by thinking about the academic indicators, likely, you know, possibly the things you might most see. Um, you know, so a sudden decline in work or grades. Now again, we're three weeks into the semester. This may not be something that you would you would notice until you start to get a feel for your students. Um, you know, but all of a sudden you have someone who's doing very well, and then they get, you know, two. You know, they're getting A's. They get two C's on quizzes. Then that doesn't mean they have a mental health issue, but it does mean it might be reasonable to say, hey, what's going on? Um, you know, any kind of repeated absences, and I know, you know, this is a bit of a more difficult one when you have some of the big lectures, but you all are likely going to be doing some smaller discussion sections. So, you know, you start to see that a student is disappearing, you know, I think it's reasonable to, to at least hold on to that in your mind. Um, any kind of uh, disorganized um, performance, and I kind of tie this sometimes with bizarre content, you know, and we always want to look in the, into the context of what's happening. We want, you know, it's Berkeley, so we want students to be able to think freely and, um, you know, and express themselves, but, you know, when things start to, to look disorganized, paper, things are handed in, you know, on papers that are all crumpled up, and, you know, you ask for an assignment on, you know, the history of France, and you get a math equation, you know, that's, that, again, reasonable person would go, hmm, that just doesn't seem like it's what, what I was asking for. Um, overly demanding, I always want to put that into context. I think, you know, students are far better at advocating for themselves these days. Uh, and I think, you know, if we, if we, again, if we talk to many people, there are, this is one where we would have different thoughts on what is demanding. Um, but when you start to find yourself doing more, more work than the student, you know, and when it feels like you're really moving away from the academics, I think that's a really good signal for yourself. Again, it doesn't mean you stand up and you run around and you scream and you worry. It just says, hmm, maybe I should find out. I can either ask the student or maybe I should get some consultation on this. So those are some of the academic kinds of things. When it comes to the physical indicators that you may see, you know, again, I want to, I, I want to, with this first one, you know, any kind of marked change in appearance, I understand that folks may come to Berkeley and then really find an identity that's different for them and embrace that. I'm not 100% sure I'm meaning that, but when you start to see really disheveled, um, you know, students not taking care of themselves, they're, they're, they're not over multiple days, it doesn't look like they're bathing, they may even, um, you know, smell in the classroom, you know, that's something to kind of think about. Any excessive fatigue, you know, you, constant sleeping in your class or in your section, um, things like that. Uh, now, again, we're not, we're not looking for you all to be doing breathalyzers, but if it's obvious that someone comes into your, your class, um, you know, intoxicated, you smell alcohol, um, you know, those are things that are, that are, are worth, you know, paying attention to. Um, any disorientation, garbled speech, you know, as they're trying to answer questions, things that you would want to think about. Now, I know that in my world, um, when I see that in my office, even with the training that I have, I don't make assumptions, you know, that, that you know, someone starts to become very disheveled, someone starts to, you know, uh, starts to sleep more, they're disoriented, there are a lot of things that could be causing that. There could be, you know, substance use that's causing that, there could be a mental health 
uh, start of a mental health diagnosis, and it can also be some physical things that are going on. So I know that one of the things that we'll do is, and, is we don't jump to conclusions, and we, again, this is where we would focus, like I said earlier, on the behavior if you're going to talk to someone and say, hey, you know, I've noticed you've been sleeping more in my class, you know, or when you walk by me, I thought I smelled alcohol. Those are focusing on the specifics that, that you know, you experienced as opposed to, I think you have a drinking problem. Um, you know, so I think that's where if these things come up, you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, again, behaviors out of context are bizarre. Um, and, you know, delusions are false beliefs. Um, you know, so, and, and many times they're paranoid. So if someone says, I think the faculty member is out to get me, Okay, well, you know, sometimes you know, there may be a reality to that. Um, but, you know, when things start to get a little more bizarre and people start talking about, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, can I get an extension on this paper? You know, the wall, you know, people have been, ta people talk through the wall to me all night long and I wasn't able to get any sleep. You know, that's a, hey, well, that's a concern. Um, besides thinking about the extension of the paper, is there something else we can do to get you some support? Thinking about a different living environment, so on and so forth, and it may be that that context helps get them into some support. So some of the emotional indicators. Um, you know, I know that, that uh, I actually just spoke to a GSI class, and one of the GSIs said, wow, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the, the conduit for students to tell, to tell me about their personal issues. I, I, you know, I try to make it clear my role is as the GSI. And I said, that's absolutely wonderful. Having said that, students may, in the course of trying to explore their academic issues, disclose things that are going on. And I think it really is a red flag. It's, a, it's something we want to pay attention to. If there's any significant fi uh, family issues, financial issues, um, you know, uh, any kind of statement about suicide, I'll talk about a minute about that later. Grief, you know, if a student comes in and says, I just lost a parent, a sibling, you know, I think it's reasonable to, to, to consider what you're going to do academically and say, okay, what are some of the other supports that you may be able to access on campus? Um, any unusual, disproportional emotional response, so a student comes to your office to talk about they're great and, and all of a sudden they're just, you know, their voice is raised, they're, you know, they're crying. You know, most people can kind of come in and, and ha even if they have some emotion about their grade, kind of keep it together. You know, excessive tearfulness or, you know, you have a student who comes in and lets you know the reason they're leaving class in the middle is they're having panic attacks. Um, you know, any kind of this opposite of irritability, really kind of agitated appearance versus, you know, any unusual apathy where just all of a sudden they, they used to be engaged and now they just don't look like they care all that much. Um, you know, verbal abuse, and this may also be a safety risk, you know, we, we tolerate no verbal abuse. Um, and, you know, it's amazing when, when students call us and say well, they're worried about a friend, something is going on. You know, students tend not to, to, to make things up. In fact, our fear is that students hold things longer than they should. And so if, if a student says, hey, I'm really worried about so-and-so in the class, I think it's reasonable for you to be concerned and think about, you know, what, what you can do next. And safety risk indicators. And again, I think this is one where, you know, as we think about the protocols, these would be the ones where, whether it be calling us or calling the police, um, you know, it's, it's important that if these things start to happen, you not hold on to them. Some of the things we talked about previously, it may be that you, 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 know, you deal with it, you give the students some resources, and, and it feels okay. These are the ones that, whether it be through the dean's Dean of Students Office, whether it be through your undergraduate advisor, whether it be through the Counseling Center, we really do want you to tell someone about. So any unprovoked anger or hostility in the classroom or in your office or through email. You know, you know sometimes students at 2 in the morning will get pretty bold at what they say. And you know, they can sit at their computer, but we don't have to be the recipients of, of that kind of verbal and written abuse. Um, any, I mean, if there's any physical violence in your classroom, in your department, you know, that to me would be a, a call to the police. Um, uh, but even hearing about it, uh, you know, uh, I think we all get kind of, whether you read the Daily Cal or sometimes there are alerts that come on. If a, if a student comes in and says, oh, I, you know, I'm worried about the test tomorrow, I got mugged the other day, you know, and beaten up and my phone was taken, 
Well, that would be, hey, what are you doing to support, you know, one of you been checked out by a doctor if, you know, you got clocked on the head, but also what are you doing for yourself? How do we, how do we make sure you feel safe in this area? Um, if students really, whether through their writing, their emails, or in front of you, talk about themes of severe hopelessness, hostility, despair, or violence, again, we don't stand up immediately and, 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 and call the police, but we say, okay, what, what's going on here? What's the information that I need to get the kind of to get a good consult, um, you know, and 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 try to think through what you're going to do. Um, and you you learn from a student about stalking or harassing, or you are the recipient. We we want you know folks to get help. And of course, I think I had said this already. Um, any communicating threats via email or phone. Um, part of this is I go, I think, into our next slides and talk a little bit about this kind of protocol. What are you going to do? Who are you going to call? Some of it when we start, I think I've said before, you, we, you don't need to be a detective. You don't need to be a, um, you know, a magician thinking what's in people's mind. But what we do want is when you call and consult with us or what the police are going to want or what the dean's office is going to want is some information. And so as we now move into what are you going to do, um, and Sue's going to talk a lot about the kind of consultations that you may have, uh, we want you to be able to ask questions of the students or of yourselves so that we can better serve you. Um, so the, what I tend, when I do residence life training, I tend to use a, um, a, something called Q, which is C-U-E. It stands for Concern, Urgent, Emergency. I tend to believe that if it's just a concern, student comes to your office and says, you know, I, I, I'm going away for a religious holiday. I'm going to miss class tomorrow. I mean, I'm not even sure that's a concern. That's, just not, that's not something that there's an immediate need for support on. Or if a student comes and says, oh, you know, I've had some struggles. Um, I'm seeing a counselor. Do you need me to get, you know, verification so that I can, because I, I missed an assignment. That's, that's a concern. They, they're, in, they're connected. Um, you know, that's something that, that, that you, you may say, hey, or what are the other resources available to you, but you're not, you don't have to act on immediately. Um, on the flip side, the emergency, I also think, again, reasonable person standard, if something happens, someone stands up in your classroom and hits another student, that's 911. That's the University of California Police Department. I think, you know, and, and those are generally pretty easy. A student sits in your office and says, you know, I do want to kill myself and I have a plan. I mean, that's, that's, an, urge, that's an emergency. That's some, you know, someone you, you need to call and get some immediate support on that. I think the struggle, and again, this is a, there's a big continuum, and for some of you the lines may get blurred on what an urgent thing is, but that's where we want you to be able to consult. That's when you go, huh, I really don't know what to do. Is this a mental health issue? Is this a police issue? Um, and quite honestly, whether you contact the dean's office, whether you contact the police, or whether you contact the counseling center, we're all going to be able to, we're likely going to recommend each other. And so there's, there's never, you know, the wrong person to call. So as you think about this, um, you know, think a little bit about that cue. What's, a, what's a, just a general concern? You know, what's an emergency? And, and, and in the urgent, that's where our protocol, and you'll see on the gold folder, really comes in when you're kind of questioning what to do. There is no stupid question when it comes to calling the counseling center. You know, and whether a student's sitting with you or whether you're on your own, there's no stupid question. So we really would encourage you to do that. Now, having said that, I do, I'm not sure where in the presentation I'm supposed to say this, I think maybe I already did, is that while we're doing this, and while the grant is coming through the counseling center, I don't always want to, I don't always want to stereotype or, or have you feel that every issue that happens in your community is a mental health issue because there may be times where it's not or even a police issue. So there're going to be times when consulting with the, you know, your faculty is going to is going to resolve the issue. Um, there're going to be times where consulting with folks like the undergraduate advisor may be the most appropriate consultation. Um, so I, you know, on the one hand, we're really making sure you know at the end of this that you can call us. On the other hand, we want to let you know there are other folks to, to talk to. Um, okay. Um, sorry, trying to, to multitask. I always say I multitask very well. I just do it one thing at a time. So I was reading some comments, trying to think through some of the questions. Um, 
So at, you know, at, this is on the gold folder, but just kind of a reminder that three of the big resources that you have, again, besides undergrad, undergrad – I'm going to start getting calls from undergraduate advisors because they're going to be like, you just mentioned us way too much in this presentation. Um, but I think three really important numbers that you have on speed dial. Uh, once you get the phone app, you'll have them all on your phone app, um, is you know, UCPD. Um, I think most folks know that if you dial 911 from a cell phone, it goes to the California Highway Patrol in the region that you're in. So I would program 510-642-3333. When you're on campus, you hit that, and it goes to the University of California Police Department. You have our two numbers, including our after-hours number. Um, so from the time our phones shut down to the time they open up the next morning, you still have access to a professional counselor to consult, one, for your own things if things come up in the middle of the night, but also if you happen to be reading that email at 2 in the morning and a student says something, now you should never be reading. We're going to talk about health. You should never be reading those emails at 2 in the morning, but if you do and the student says something uncomfortable, that's a time that you can call that after hours number. And then we'll talk more about um, you know, consulting with the students of concern and filling out what's called a care report. Um, so I think I can take a deep breath and let Sue talk for a bit. Okay, this is Susan again, and hopefully you can hear me a little better this time. We are adjusting things with the speaker because I have a smaller head <laughs> than Aaron. So I am now going to talk about the counseling and psychological services. So this is one of the important resources that you will need to know about in terms of directing students when they're needing our help, as well as support for yourself, um, whether that be for counseling for yourself or for consultation. And I will talk specifically about consultation in a minute. So just to share a little bit about counseling and psychological services, we refer to ourselves as CPS, so you might hear that acronym around campus. What we provide is brief personal, academic, and career counseling for all registered students, irrespective of their insurance plan. So one of the misconceptions is that you need to have the student health insurance plan ship in order to be able to use, that, use CPS, and that is not true. Any student can come in and use our services, undergrad and grad, as long as you're registered. The main office is on the third floor of the Tang Center, and there are actually 10 other satellite offices throughout the campus, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have professional counselors that work with students on a broad range of concerns, not stress, anxiety, depression, procrastination, relationships, sexual orientation, trauma and crisis, just to name a few. And one thing I do want to mention is that Students can be reluctant to engage in ongoing treatment. That may feel scary to them. Many of our students actually come in for one to two counseling sessions, which can be very, very helpful. So they don't have to make a long-term commitment. And actually, the number of sessions is determined by the counselor when the student comes in based on the student's needs and the counseling plan with a maximum of eight sessions per year. Uh, many, if students are needing something different than that, if they're needing more ongoing counseling or if they're needing a specific kind of counseling that we don't offer, we help them find referrals in the community. And there are lots of low fee referrals. Um, with the SHIP plan, it is only $15 per session to see somebody in the community, which is very reasonable. We also refer to psychiatrists and for medication management if the student is needing psychiatric medication. And um, students can call or they can drop in between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. are our drop-in hours if students want to get counseling started in that way. What I like to tell people on campus is that if a student is apprehensive about coming to CPS, you might want to think about the satellite offices. And if you go to the counseling part of the UHS website, you can, there is a place where you can look up the various satellite locations. And at each of the satellite locations, there are opportunities for students to just drop in and to meet with a counselor and chat about counseling and how it might be helpful to them. 
and students don't need to make an appointment. They don't need to fill out paperwork. These are some of the barriers that are that are make it difficult for students to access counseling, and we're trying to create ways that it's more accessible to students at these satellite offices. I've also, we have the website on here, the uhs.berkeley.edu. You can find a lot more information about how students can use our services. I do want to say a few words about how to bring up the idea of counseling. This is one of the more common questions that we get on campus. Well, how do I bring it up? What is counseling anyway? How, it, how would it be helpful to a student? Erin said some important things earlier about first expressing your concern, pulling the student aside in a private place, maybe after the class or during office hours, being direct about your concern and being as behavioral as possible and as specific as possible with your concerns. And the next step, and, and expressing concern, having a compassionate, concerned t way to talk to them. Are you OK is a simple way to do that, just asking the person directly. But after you've done that, it can be um, very helpful to talk about counseling. You might start the conversation by saying, have you ever considered counseling? Do you know about CPS? You might want to ask that question. Maybe the student has already been there. They may volunteer that. Or maybe they didn't even know that the counseling service existed. So if you have the flyer, if you have information in your desk, you can hand that to them. You can provide them with some more information. You might talk about how counseling would be helpful. Some ideas about how you might do this would be to talk about how counseling provides an unbiased perspective. So if you think about it, talking with your family and friends, they have an emotional investment in your figuring things out in a particular way. So talking to someone who's not personally involved with you can be very important. Someone trained to, talk, to help students solve problems like theirs. That's a way to normalize the problem by saying that other students have that problem, the problem that they're talking about, and to talk about the importance of their talking to someone who has the training to work on it with them. I think it's important to, if somebody seems um, depressed or anxious, to, to let them know that it's not a matter of willpower, of just willing themselves to be better or being more disciplined, but it's about learning new skills. And that can be a way to broach the subject of counseling. Everyone needs support. Everyone gets stuck in their lives at different points. And it really takes courage to seek help. Those are some other ways to talk about it. You, talking about the confidentiality of CPS is important. It makes, our, makes students feel safe, letting them know that CPS will not talk to professors or parents or GSIs unless the, students, the student wants us to. They would need to sign a form that allows us to let them, anybody know that they've come in. And we certainly wouldn't be able to talk about what they talked about unless we had that release. And to normalize how normalize counseling, that so many students do do this. And even if it's not normal from the background or the family that they come from, it is very normal here on our campus. Close to 16% of the campus now seek counseling help from CPS. And that does not include peer counselors and other kind of advising on the campus. If you feel comfortable, if you have had counseling yourself, it's perfectly fine to disclose that to the student and let them know that you found it very helpful. And it might make them feel more comfortable doing it as well. If the student is if reluctant to seek help, or if you're very worried about them, or both, you may want to help the student make the call. You may pick up the phone in your office and say, let's call together. Let's see if we can get you an appointment. Or let's see if we can find out more about how to get you in today. You might walk them over if you feel safe doing that. Um, if you know where we are and it's not a long walk and you're not concerned about their safety, you might want to walk them down to CPS. It is important that you accept that there may be resistances to counseling, especially the first time somebody brings it up. A student may tell you that they feel like it's a weakness to seek help. And you definitely just want to listen and accept their resistance, maybe provide a different way of thinking about it talking about the difference between independence and isolation, or talking about um, what I like to do. One of the things that I talk about is how um, 
you wouldn't think about coming to college and not buying books and not doing, going to classes because those are the tools you need to do well in school. Well, if you think about counseling as another tool, that tool, that can be a helpful way to bring it up. One other point here is that you may want to consider ways of, of help seeking that may be more acceptable to the student. So if the student goes to a satellite office, that might be more acceptable, or coming in for career concerns or health-related issues rather than personal ones, that may be helpful. And you may um, want to make a follow-up appointment, say, let's meet in a week, and if you're going to go to counseling, let's talk about how it went. One of the things about CPS is that we can't share with you, as I mentioned earlier, we can't share whether the student came in or not. And, um, so, but you can follow up with the student and ask them how it went and whether they were able to make it there. If the student doesn't want to come in and they really are resistant, you, don't, you want to just accept that and not push. You can't make somebody seek counseling, and you don't want to jeopardize your relationship with the student. Just bring it up at a later time. And this might be an opportunity for you to consult with Counseling and Psych Services, which leads leads us to the next slide, and that is specifically about consulting with Counseling and Psych Services. If there's one thing that you walk away from this training with, um, one slide that's the most important, it's about consulting. Um, and I am going to specifically talk about consulting with CPS, and then I am also going to talk about consulting with the Students of Concern Committee in just a few minutes. There are many reasons why you would want to con consult with Counseling and Psych Services. One of the reasons would be if you don't know how concerned to be. So let's just say um, a student is showing some signs of distress, but you're not just sure how serious it is, you're not sure if you're overreacting. You, if you pick up the phone and you call a counselor, if you call the main number for CPS and ask to speak to a counselor, they will talk it through with you. They will um, ask you questions and get a little bit more information. They know what questions to ask. If there's emails involved, they can take a look at the emails. So they can, get, they can use their professional judgment to let you know how serious they think the concern is. You may also call Counseling on Psych Services if you are having trouble getting the student over there. Let's just say the student is resistant to help, as I mentioned earlier. They refuse to go. This, that's a good opportunity for you to consult with a counselor about um, how you might, stra you might strategize or think of new ideas of how to encourage them to come in. The other piece here um, is if you think the student will be coming in for counseling, but you don't think they will bring up all the important pieces of what's going on. Let's just say the student shared with you that they are having some suicidal thoughts, and they say, I'm going over to counseling right now, but you think they may not talk about that with the counselor. Or they've mentioned something about an eating disorder, but you think they're going to be talking about stress with the counselor and not bringing up the eating issues. You can call over and share the information you have, and the counselor that's going to meet with the student will have that information. So that way, we, um, we, the, the information can come in and the counselor can be informed. Many times, GSIs, faculty and staff, are worried about sharing information with CPS. They're worried that it's a violation of privacy. So I do want to say a few words about FERPA, which refers to the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And FERPA actually has more to do with academic records than it does around the issue of consulting. You are free as a faculty, staff, or GSI to share your observations about students with other UC personnel who have a responsibility for their welfare. So you can share the, your infor this information, the concerns you have, freely with the CPS counselor. CPS has more confidentiality restrictions due to federal laws like HIPAA, which you may have heard of, state laws, and professional ethics. The counselors at CPS can't share whether the student came in or the nature of their visits, as I mentioned earlier. But um, they are free to consult with you and give you advice on how to help students that you're working with. I see there's a question here. 
um, if a student is going to counseling, what sort of academic accommodations, extensions on deadlines, making up tests, if any, should I do for students? So it's a very good question. Um, and certain kind, it, it is on occasion, it, it's perfectly legitimate for a GSI, perhaps in consultation with the faculty running the class, to give a one-time only accommodation if something came up. Um, they, you might ask them if, if they say there was a medical issue or they came to the Tang Center, you might ask them for some kind of verification that that's the case. But that, the, you, you can do that, use your, your judgment. I'm going to have Aaron speak to this as well. But it is important to know that for accommodations, if a student has a medical issue or an ongoing psychological issue, that they should be connected to Disabled Students Program. I'm going to give the headphones to Aaron so he can answer the question further. Um, you know what, I actually, I, I worked in the Disabled Students Program for six years, so this is one that I, I, I kind of have dear to my heart, and that is I think we have to work with words. If a student is requesting an accommodation, that's a legally mandated request due to disability, and that must come through the Disabled Students Program. I think if, if a student says, can I have a one-time adjustment because I've had some medical concerns, I had mono and I was out for three weeks, then I think you and the faculty in charge or the department, whatever the policies are of the department to, to grant that kind of adjustment would be the place that you go. But when I start to read the word accommodation, I really think legally mandated, and that has to come through the Disabled Students Program. So giving it back to Sue. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for clarifying that. I am now going to move into talking about the Students of Concern Committee. And um, this is a very important resource, resource on our campus when you're worried about a student. I'm going to share a little bit about what the Students of Concern Committee is and how you would actually um, get connected to the, to the committee. So what the Student of Concern Committee is, is a multidisciplinary body of stakeholders from across the university who are concerned about students' welfare. What does that mean? It's a representatives from various offices on the campus. I believe there are now nine offices represented on the committee. And this committee comes together, and they share information, and they develop a coordinated plan for how to help the student and how to keep the campus safe. Um, we, the committee receives referrals from the campus, they collect the information, and then they come up with the strategies to address what's going on. The Students of Concern Committee, um, they're now widespread at various campuses nationwide. They really developed after Virginia Tech. What they, when there were reports that looked at what happened at Virginia Tech and the shooting there, it became clear that departments needed to talk with one another. They couldn't be in silos, that they really needed to share information. Um, and it was also clear that we needed to provide early intervention for at-risk students. So these ideas came together, and many campuses now, it's considered a best practice to have a committee such as the Student of Concern Committee on our campus. I actually have with us today, um, Al Day, who is the care manager um, who, from the Student of Concern Committee. Uh, Al joined our campus rather recently in the last month. And I wanted him to introduce himself. And so you um, can actually meet. He is in the, student, the, the dean's office, um, the undergraduate dean's office, where the committee is housed. And I'm going to hand the headphones over to him so he can introduce himself. Hello, everyone. I'm Alfred Day. Uh, I've just been here a little over, uh, this is my second week uh, in the Dean of Students office as the care manager for the uh, Students of Concern Committee. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to talk later on about how to refer students uh, to us. But uh, in a nutshell, it's my job to make sure that uh, we're responding and taking uh, the things that come to us seriously and, and to coordinate, to assist in coordinating the response amongst the variety of departments uh, that are involved. 
So I'm going to go ahead and give it back to Sue uh, to continue. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, I have the next, the next slide here talks about when you would refer a student to the committee. And this is a question that often comes up. People say, I'm, not, I'm confused. I don't know if I should be calling Counseling and Psych Services or should I be um, getting in touch with Student of Concern Committee. Um, on one level, it doesn't matter because um, if you call Counseling and Psych Services and we think you should be also um, getting in touch with the Student of Concern Committee, we're going to let you know and vice versa. But I think it is, it is helpful to understand the differentiation between the committees and the, the, between the committee and counseling and psych services. So this slide will help with that. So when would you refer a student to the committee? If a student seems distressed or erratic in their behavior. One of the, one of the things is when a student is, is erratic in their behavior, often they're not just erratic in your class but they may be acting that way in other settings. They may be acting that way in the res halls. They may be acting that way in other classes. So you really do want to have that information shared in the committee so that we can understand how concerned to be. Are they, is there something going on for this student that's coming up in many different arenas? If you're uncertain if there's a mental health issue, you, um, but the student needs help. So for example, um, there, I, I think it's helpful to have examples for these kinds of issues. If a student is just disappeared, a student is no, has, been, has disappeared and they're no longer showing up in class, is that a mental health issue? We don't know. There could be a lot of reasons why they're not there. Um, that is something that you would want to um, contact the Student of Concern Committee. If somebody doesn't have money to eat, if they're homeless and that becomes apparent. Again, is that a mental health issue? We don't know but the Student of Concern Committee can help. If you are getting stuck in managing a disruptive student, so um, it may be that a student is disruptive, but they're not breaking any conduct rules, but you're having trouble containing the situation. They may be argumentative or escalating with different people. Um, and you, want, you may need help of the Student of Concern Committee in, de in developing a coordinated plan of how you're going to deal with that situation in your department. One thing I want to let you know is that CPS has a high threshold for sharing information. So we can only share information with other offices or other uh, people if there's a danger to oneself or others or child abuse situations. But the Dean of Students Office, where the Student of Concern Committee is housed, is bound by FERPA only. So this enables them to share information across offices that a, so that a plan can be made for helping the student and ensuring the safety of the campus. So those are some of the reasons why you would um, be in touch with the Student of Concern Committee. And I want to now share with you how do you engage with the Student of Concern Committee. So the first step for you as a GSI is you want to consult with your faculty advisor. You don't want to be doing any of this until you first speak with them, and they will help you with this process. With the support of your instructor, you can submit a report using the secure online form. And I believe we have that. You can actually find that on if you do a search, a Student of Concern Committee. There's a web page on the campus, and you can actually get the link right there and submit the report. There's a lot of questions they ask about what you're observing and what the concerns are. And so you want to submit that electronically. What will happen next is that the committee will review the, review the report, will collect information. They may call you for clarification if there's questions. And the committee will then discuss the student at their meeting and come up with a plan for what to do. And that could mean reaching out to the student. Sometimes the Dean of Students Office calls students in to talk with them. Sometimes the plan is different than that. Uh, we may or may not contact the department depending on what the plan is. But you should always feel free to pick up the phone and call the student of concern um, directly if you have any questions about what's happening or um, what, what you should be doing to support the student.
The Student of Concern Committee does not take the place of the other services that are on the campus. So if the student is breaking university rules, if, there, if there's a cheating incident, if there's any kind of harassment or um, stalking or anything like that that you're becoming aware of, you really want to make sure that you contact student conduct uh, so that it can be investigated. Um, this committee does not take the, replace of, take the place of that. If you're worried about the safety of a student, you still want to call UCPD. And if you're, um, and it does not take the place of calling CPS for help in directing the student to counseling. It's certainly not, uh, you do not want to take an emergency situation that Aaron was talking about before and, and use that as an opportunity to submit a report because that report may not be looked at that day and you need immediate help. You don't want to just be filling out the online form. And we do not accept anonymous reports. You will need to identify who you are when you submit that. We will, um, if you have questions about the Student of Concern Committee, we will look for them and I will, we will jump back to that. But I do want to, um, before we get into some scenarios, I do want to talk a little bit about your role as GSI once again. And um, I, I want to talk a little bit more about this role as a gatekeeper. And I think it's important that while you, be, you know that you can be compassionate and concerned, that you can also set boundaries. It's okay to say that you're not trained to help them. It's okay to direct somebody to CPS because um, you're, not, you're not in a role of being able to do that. You don't need to solve the student's problem, problems. Often the problems that they, they are talking about are complex, involving behavioral, emotional, and situational components and they can be very time consuming and involve counseling skills. And it also can be counterproductive to solve the problem for the student. They really need to learn how to solve problems on their own. As Erin was mentioning earlier, it's really important to know what your limits are. How much time do you have to spend with the student? How willing are you to explore what's going on for them? Everybody has different comfort levels with feelings, Every, and it's really fine to define what your role is in a way that's comfortable for you. I know that sometimes GSIs are re reluctant to set limits because they think, well, the student is not yet in counseling. I have to keep helping them. Um, and students can push the limits. And that's when it's very important to talk to the, to the professor in charge or, or to the departmental chair so you can set up a protocol of how to manage the situation. Um, Sometimes it's helpful to have one person who deals with a student rather than having lots of people. Um, you want to give a consistent message about what the limits are. I prepared this slide because um, this is to supplement something that Aaron talked about earlier. And he was talking about what are the signs that a student is distressed and what to notice in the, other, in the student. But I think you can also um, look within to find out whether there's a problem. Um, you, it's important that you um, be able to use yourself as a barometer of whether the person needs help. And so how do you know when the support that you can offer is not enough? If definitely if you have concerns about their safety, if you're feeling res overly responsible for the student, if you feel pressured to solve their student's problem, if you're extending yourself a lot for the student um, and feeling stressed out, or if you see a behavioral pr pattern. And what I mean by that is maybe the student um, couldn't get their work done because they procrastinated, and then that happens over and over and over again. Or an illness that they get stressed in the middle of the semester and then they get ill, and it happens over and over and over again. There's a behavioral pattern that um, so that's a sign that they need to they need some help besides the support that you can offer. And you can definitely listen. You can provide compassion and a caring response. You can offer support and advice on how they can do better in their work. That can go a long way in helping the student feel better. But sometimes that kind of support is not enough, and that's what we're talking about in terms of reading and gauging how you're feeling.
Oh, hello all again. It is Aaron. And um, so we, we thought, you know, how could we be talking to, to GSIs without really acknowledging out loud that y'all are students? Um, and that in fact, all this stuff that we've been talking to you about and, and, and at some level training you on, we talk to faculty and staff about even for you. you know, so you're kind of getting both ends of the, of the stick, as they say. Um, so we, we also just wanted to, to just at least bring this all back into the room that you are students as well, that you go through your own stressors. And, and, you know, and, and I mean, Susan and I have bo both have uh, doctorates, so we've been through the process of having to write a dissertation, having to sit for quals. You know, having to sit and work for a professor and so on and so forth. So we know that, that you have your own unique things. And we just kind of want to remind you that it's important to take care of yourself. Um, now I'll just say one source of stress management or source of stress for me is when I know that I'm going to, um, or my anxiety at the beginning of a, a presentation is that I'm not going to, I'm going to get through it in three minutes, and then I always get to the end and I realize I need 30 more. So I am, I'm very aware of our time. I do have an evaluation I want you all to do at the end of this, so I'm going to um, try to do this in a way that, that, that you know, we get to these slides appropriately. So. By all means, we want, I can only imagine if you haven't experienced some of these things, you will experience some of these things. Now, I will say none of you at Cal will have a difficult advisor relationship. Um, but you know, it's important that you all take care of yourselves. I think I talked to some physics GSIs a few weeks ago where I said, you know, if you as an undergraduate had done some counseling and you, you came to Cal thinking, you know what, I did that, I'm done with it, you know, one of the things I would really have you think about is that why not, we're, Cal is a really good proactive institution. We're not as good reactively. And so I would, as a GSI, I would be promoting that thought to your students and I would promote it to you as well. When we, when, when we on this campus learn about things proactively, uh, we're better, better able to react more flexibly. So if you think you're going to have some struggles with your qualifying exams, get some support before you get to your qualifying exams. It's much easier to get that support than a week before your qualifying exams, or whatever the example is. And I would say the same for you to be supporting your students to say, listen, if, if there's some pressure points in this class, let's make sure you get the kinds of supports, whether it be academic, counseling, um, financial before it becomes the problem that you're anticipating. So here are some com common stressors that we see at the Counseling Center. Again, it's not an exhaustive list. And then we want to make sure that you are taking care of yourselves. We actually did a, re a, a survey in 2004. I think almost 4,000 graduate students um, answered the survey. And, and with that, 45% of the folks said, you know, at one point in the last year, I had such a significant stress-related incident that it kept me from doing something. You know, so it's really important to monitor your stress level. Um, you know, take time to, to rest, to relax. You know, I, with everybody that I talk to, sleep, eat right, r rest, relaxation, and exercise are really important things. Don't isolate yourself. Get connected with other um, with other graduate students. I love the fact that I, I'm pretty sure all of you are in these 300 level courses. You know, use those times to say, hey, this is what I experienced in my class. Has anyone else had this issue with a student? You know, you know, use these to get support for yourself. And again, everything that Susan said about the Counseling Center is available to you as well. And we want to make sure that you get the, the appropriate supports. We have some specific, um, like for our groups program, we have specific groups for graduate students. Um, and they change semester to semester. So there was that UHS link in there. Um, you can go to that link and, and just look up Counseling and Psych Services groups. Um, you know, and we, you know, we do offer the same, the same counseling um, you know, that we offer for, this, for the undergrads for you, and we want you to be able to take advantage of that. So let me um, jump into our first scenario. You know, Susan and I were actually a little reluctant to do a scenario because it's hard to do this without there being some interaction. Um, and so we're going to kind of just talk it out loud, say a couple things that we think may impact you with the course of this student, um, but understand that, that it isn't, we're not covering every basis. What I'm putting on paper is a very dynamic situation that, that could change from situation to situation, so we will kind of talk through it at least. 
So what I want you to do is not read the third bullet point. Now that I said that, I know you just read it, but at least read the first two. So you have a student who's a 19-year-old, it's a woman, 19-year-old Korean international student who's a first semester freshman. So without anything else, you can think about now that you've been through this, some of the stressors that there may be. You know, it's, it's a new person. It's their first semester at Cal. Um, they're an international student, so they, they may have been in the, the country for a long time, or it may be that it's their first, first um, trip over you know, into, in, at to Cal. So just in and of itself, you can kind of think through some of the things that may be uh, pinch points for them. Then let's go to the second one. Again, without reading the third, it's someone who comes to you because they want to be an econ major. So you're an econ GSI right now. I don't know if there's anyone out there. Um, and they're struggling in the Economics 100A course, which is where you're GSIing. They need a B in order to get admitted into the major. Now again, we're three weeks into the semester, so you may already be wondering, wow, this is an interesting thing that they're coming in. But without the bottom portion, there's lots that you can be doing. This would probably be one of those C, those concerned students, where they're saying they're stressed, they're wanting some help. Um, you know, so it may be that this is the kind of student all you do is say, hey, this is what you need to get a B. Or, you know what, you're getting a B. Or, you know, and you say, what's going on that you're worried about this? Is there anything else happening? Um, but also that if they're needing supports in, in working with their grade, you know, whether it be the undergrad advisor, the, an LNS advisor, or one of the tutoring programs at Chavez, there are things that can be available to supports for students, so to think through that. So now we'll allow you to read the third sentence, which I know you all already read, um, and it does add a, deep, a more complex space. And, but I will say this, don't read the last, forget, for right now let's forget the last sentence. So now you have someone who's worried about their grade and they say to you, both in email and then coming in to see you, that they're just, they're, they're not doing well. They, they're having some family problems, they're having financial problems, some relations, so they kind of dump it all in your, in your lap. And I think, you know, Sue used the word compassion, empathy. You don't have to be a therapist. You don't have to be a counselor. But I think you can be compassionate. You can wonder what it would be like if you were in that student's shoes. Um, and try to think with them what supports are available to them on the campus. You know, so being open and honest and talking to them about that, I think, is, a, is an important thing. Um, acknowledge that stress comes with Cal. Sometimes I think Cal stands for stress. And you know, that would be maybe even just on that note where you might refer to the counseling center. Now sometimes for international students, I would use language like advising. You know, the counseling center is really good at advising students on how to get through their programs. You know, some students, even though the word counseling is in our, in our name, some students respond better that, that, you know, to GSI saying, well, I think you could get some good advising over there as opposed to, I think you need counseling. Um, you know, so that's just another thing to think about. So with, with that, what if the student under her breath says that life isn't worth it anymore? Well, I think you know, one of the things that we knew we weren't going to be doing in this training is teaching you how to do suicide assessment, because that's really not your role. Now having said that, like I said before, when a student hits you over the head with some, something, I think it's reasonable to be able to ask some basic questions. And again, you're asking these questions so that you can consult appropriately with the counseling center, the police, the dean of students office. And if someone said that, that life isn't worth it anymore, at the least I would be able to say, can you please tell me what you just meant? You know. What did you just say? Can you, what did you mean? I think that's a reasonable place to start. Um, if you're uncomfortable asking directly about suicide, it's also reasonable to say to someone, well, have you thought about not wanting to live anymore? Is that what you mean? Now, I once had this circumstance, and the, the student said, this isn't worth it anymore. And I, was, I got really anxious, and it was like they were thinking of just switching majors or something like that. So it really wasn't um, you know, this negative fantasy that I had that it was suicide. So being able to say, what did you mean? Have you thought about not wanting to live anymore? And I do think it's reason reasonable to be able to ask the questions, have you thought about killing yourself, if they answer those questions, um, and do you have a plan? I think at the least those are some basic things that you can hold on to so that when you get that information, you can consult with someone and have that. Again, whether it be the police 
us at the counseling center. Um, and with that, if the student is sitting in your office, I, that would be a reasonable place to say, you know what, I wanna, I, let's figure out how to get you some help. I'm going to call one of the TANG counselors and consult and say, hey, I'm sitting with a student. This is what she's saying to me. Can you help me make a decision on what we can do? And it may be that the counselor works with you to get the student an, uh, an appointment the next morning or an immediate walk-in appointment if the student is willing to come down. Again, it may be that you're willing to walk the student down for drop-in hours, for our urgent drop-in hours. A lot of different things can happen, but more than anything, we want you to know that you don't have to feel like you're alone on this. Now, if you know you've received an email like this, you may want to make sure one of your other GSI friends or the faculty in charge of the class is around when you meet with the student so that there's, there's someone right there that you can consult with. Um, so we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to do one thing before we go to our last scenario. And again, I know we never have enough time. I will let you know that we do have a very specialized training on this campus for kind of assessing and, and helping bystanders and friends and faculty and GSIs talk more about suicide with students. But in and of itself, it's an hour long. So this was really about just the generals of how you think about distress, looking at some of the protocols. I would love to come to your departments, come to do train. I mean, we're probably going to be offering some trainings at the counseling center next semester, where we do a full hour, hour and a half just on suicide and risk for students to help their friends, for GSIs to help students, and for faculty and staff to help students. Um, we're going to do the last scenario, but I know we're getting close to noon. Um, and so one of the things I want to do is just put this slide up. If you're having to hang up quickly, please um, text UC to this phone number, 24587, and you will get um, a text back with an evaluation that is really important for us to have. It is part of the grant. It's so unbelievable. You don't have to fill it out now, but if you text this UC at uh, 24587, now you will get it so that you can fill it out at a later time. And it is important for the grant that we have that. So I'm going to let Sue do our second scenario. I know we're, we're running low on time, but we'll hang for a minute. Hold on, here she is. Okay, we're going to, I wish we had more time, but I'm going to do this rather fast. In this scenario, we have a student who's 34 years old who's been attending Cal off and on for the past 16 years, so an older student who was enrolled in a small class, and he's been disruptive. Um, let's see. Um, he's been disruptive in class with nonlinear tangential thinking. The student has come to see you because he would like to lodge a complaint against the professor whom he felt was making personal hostile remarks that were directed at him. And as you talk to the student, he begins to escalate talking loudly and swearing throughout the conversation. He makes comments about making people pay for their mistakes. So here, we have a different kind of situation. We have a situation where you worry about the student escalating and potentially becoming violent. And um, this is, would be an important one to talk about, but just a few pointers here. Um, first of all, you've got an escalating student. So you want to think about how do you de-escalate the situation and how do you set some limits. You don't want a student yelling at you and, and you don't know what he's going to do next. So you tell your student that you understand that he's upset, but he needs to stop yelling and swearing. And you want to be direct and behavioral about that. If he continues, you say you need to let him know if he continues to yell, you'll have to stop the meeting and meet when he calms down. You can express some concern, but let him know that you're not the place to deal with grade appeals. We actually have a whole process for dealing with grade appeals. Um, some of that is departmental, so the student can file an appeal through the department. There's a department level, the departmental appeal through the head of the department. Um, they can also contact the student on BUDS. And there are also formal uh, grade complaint procedures um, through the university, through the dean, through the vice chancellor of student affairs, and through graduate division. Usually it goes through the department first. But um, you know, wouldn't want to go in through that level of detail if the student is escalating, just letting him know that um, you understand his concern and you'd be happy to direct him to the people who can help him. If he continues to escalate, you want to get yourself out of the situation. 
So you might want to say, I really need to consult with somebody about how we can help you. And you walk out of the room, get yourself to a safe place, you want to call UCPD. You also um, want to consult with your professor and consult with your department because if the student is going to come back to your office hours and do this again, you want to have a plan of how you're going to deal with that. You probably don't want to have your door closed. You probably want to have the door open, maybe have somebody outside listening, some code words to how to keep yourself safe. So um, this is a situation where you it's unclear what's going on for this student. It, there are some signs that it might be a mental health issue, but there might be other issues as well. This would be a, uh, definitely a situation where you would want to submit a report to the Student of Concern Committee and perhaps consult with them about what to do next. Um, and it's also, um, it, it, you also might want to also call the Counseling and Psych Services um, so that we would have the information in case the student comes in. I am aware of the time. We are now at 12 o'clock. Um, thank you, everybody, for being part of this webinar. We hope that if you have further questions, you'll give us a call. All of our information is on the websites, and it was a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Okay.